for oh it's quite a at home with four indies that's what it's called it's <laughs> it's a uh, not easy to remember as you might think my name is patrick ness uh i am very pleased to be here on this live uh facebook live which i've never done before as you can tell it's my first time um, this is my office people complain that it's not very picturesque but that's because the view is sort of beyond my computer i'm looking at nice windows and some nice windows to the side um, this is to light the candles that I have in case, you know, it gets dark. Um, but anyway, hello, my name is Patrick Ness, as I said, I'm the author of Burn, which is what I'll be talking about today to you guys. Uh, it is the first of my books, pretty much the first, I've written 12, this is my 12th, and it's the first of my books to um, be describable in a single sentence. I will warm up. This stumbling, I will warm up. Trust me, I will. I will calm down and I will get more and more used to this. It's all good. Um, first of my 12 books to um, be describable in one sentence, which is that it's uh, 1950s America, but with dragons. Yeah, it opens in 1957 in the northwest of the United States, which is where I grew up. Oh, a lot of people saying hello. Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, Utahkin, which is where I grew up, set up in Frome, Washington, which if you've read my other books, you might be familiar with Frome. It's my little made-up town that I quite like. Uh, and as the book opens in 1957, Sarah Dewhurst, who is just about to turn 16, and her father are waiting for the dragon that they've hired to work on their farm. And this is um, only the poorest of the poor. Um, you have to do this. Um, and so uh, it goes from there. This dragon arrives. His name is Casimir. He turns out to be a Russian blue dragon, which is a rare dragon these days. Um, and uh, he comes with more than he seems to. He comes with a prophecy. And that prophecy may be about to sweep a bunch of things away. Or it may not. That's the question of the book. The second storyline is that uh, on his way to this little town to from Washington is a teenage assassin, because of course he's a teenager assassin called Malcolm who was raised in a cult that worships dragons called the Believers and those two storylines are gonna crash into each other and intersect and get tangled up and things go crazy. It is probably the fastest book I've written since The Knife of Never Letting Go. Lots of cool exciting stuff happens um, if I do say so myself. Um, hello everybody, hello all of you people, Danny and Kim and Tracy and Stephanie and Sue and Jane and Char and Nicola. Um, and also a huge hello from me to um, Book of Books, Bookish Books, Forum Books, and Lingham's Books, I assume, uh, who are the four indies that I am currently at home with. And I am at home. This is my home. I'm coming to you from Los Angeles um, in my office. It's a beautiful sunny day here. I'm sorry if it's not a beautiful sunny day where you are. But what I'm going to do is uh, the booksellers at these bookshops, um, these four fantastic independent bookstores, which you should patronize. I tend to order all my books in this quarantine from from Book Soup, which is in Los Angeles, which is my favorite independent. But uh, they've asked me some questions about Burn, or they should have found a little plinth that I could set this on. Um, and I'm going to answer those questions. But if you've got questions, you can put them in the uh, comment section. Oh, oh, it doesn't scroll down on its own. Hello, Ruth and Carrie and Pedro and Danny again and. Sue and Carrie and Carrie again. Anyway, lots of people. So I'm going to have to, it doesn't scroll by itself. I'm going to have, I'm learning. I'm learning as I go. And Josh, hey, a boy. Good. Rebecca, I'm kidding. Rebecca and Christina and Laura. So first question from the booksellers is what appealed to you about the 1950s America setting? And how do you think that resonates with today's current political climate, nationalism, and resurgence of hate crimes? I mean, that's a fairly serious question. Um, it's fairly deep. And, um, uh, the book, I think, is more fun than that. I think the book is, you know, it's a rocket ride with dragons. There's dragons. I mean, you know, they're fantastic. There's dragons. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the 1950s were kind of a, there was the Cold War going on. Um, the world had been at peace after World War II, but the scars of World War II were still kind of resonating. And, um, gosh, there's a lot of you saying hello. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, gosh, hi, all of you. Um, so, uh, and this video will be available later to watch as well, so I'm not going to make it go on forever. Um, but um, I, uh, oof, I'm, I'm warming up. I'm cool, calming down. I'm, you know, I'm getting into the groove of this. And I just thought, actually, the, the 1950s setting started with something I've said before in other places. So if you've heard this, forgive me. Which is, Back to the Future 
only is a comedy if you're a straight white guy. If you're anybody else, um, your you know, standard of life is going to really plummet and it's going to really suck. And uh, that always, you know, made me laugh a little bit, you know, because I wouldn't want to go back to the 50s. Um, not, not many gay bars in the 50s. And uh, so I thought, well, what about all those people that we don't see? that did exist, had thriving lives. You know, I come from a, quite a multiracial family, um, you know, and I thought, well, what, well, they were there. Why don't we ever see them? And so that's where it started. The question started. So I put in some people who look like my family, I put in some people who look like myself. I just asked the question about the 50s. So that's, um, that's the, um, that's the reason for the setting. I think I'm calming down now. Look at my hair. Look how long it is. It's crazy. Uh, another book here. Another question. Your books often have some kind of supernatural or unexplained element. Monsters, zombies, ghosts. Not too many zombies, if, if you know, we're looking back over my catalog. What is it about them that appeals to you, us so much as a reader, and why do they work so well when discussing complex moral questions? Well, see, this goes to my long-standing writing theory, which is, if you're a writer out there, and I'll bet you that there are some, I'll bet that. announce yourself as a writer in the comments if you are a writer. Um, Thank you, Laura, for saying my hair looks awesome. There's just a lot of it. It gets, it gets getting a little taller by the moment. Um, I have this long-standing theory that there is no such thing as a realistic novel, that all novels are fantasy, all of them. Even if they look like um, the world around us, even if they look like contemporary, wherever you are, it's still a fantasy. It's still made up. It's still characters arcing towards destinies and lives full of coincidences. Um, it's still a fantasy. And, um, uh, oh, I see all these things coming in. More people loving there. Hi, Rosie. That's what Bubba says. She's supposed to say that. Um, and uh, if you can embrace the idea that all fiction is fantasy, then all you need to do is create a universe where your story can logically take place. And that's it. And so all fiction uses fantastical elements to talk about complex moral qu questions. All of it. They just don't look like it all the time. So... This is a, uh, I just think if I, if I can embrace that sort of slide between putatively realistic and putatively fantastical, then I don't know, all you need to do is tell a story that feels real for the universe that you made it in. So that's why I think about that. Question about my dragons, why dragons? Well, why not dragons? Um, you know, why not dragons? Dragons are awesome. I, I kind of think dragons sort of symbolize the yearning in all of us. You know, we all kind of reach and want something that's bigger the, the the power the size the magic the intelligence because my dragons talk most dragons dragons should talk if dragons don't talk game of thrones then i would feel always feel a little cheated um and uh i don't know i just uh the first dragon i really loved was in a disney movie from like 1981 82 called dragon slayer and uh not dragon heart which is another far far, far less superior film than Dragon Slayer. And uh, I just loved it. You know, it obviously made a, uh, a deep impression. And um, I always wanted to write a novel about dragons. And so, you know, again, I'm up to book number 12. This is book number 12. I never thought I'd get one, you know. So when I got up to 12 and I thought, well, if you're, when are you going to do it? You know, <laughs> if you're not going to do it now, why not now? So whenever anybody says, why dragons? I always say, well, why not dragons? If you could write about dragons, why wouldn't, wouldn't you be writing about dragons? So cool, lots of questions coming in. Um, signed editions that I signed in the UK were in orange. Yes, that was on purpose. That is my extremely clever publicist who, um, if you get if you have an early signed copy of release, uh, release perfectly matches the cover of the ink as well. We do we do that on purpose. She does that. It's very clever of her. Um, and someone's asking, what do you like about writing dystopian fiction? I I I think I've only written. No, that's not true. I suppose Chaos Walking is kind of dystopian, and more than this is kind of dystopian. But I mean, I don't like it in particular, you know, because no fiction, the best fiction about the future, of course, isn't about the future. It's always about now. It's about looking at how the world feels now. And when I look back at my books, when I look back at pretty much all of them, um, I've said this before, I've never really noticed that they all tend to be about how to survive the end of the world. Because if you're a teenager, especially, but even for pretty much everyone else, if you're, well, the world feels like it's ending every day. It really does. If you're 16 years old, 
it feels like the world's ending every day. And the reason it feels like it's ending every day is because it's ending every day. That is 100% true. And that's the question isn't about how do we deal with the end of the world, it's how do we live after? Because it's it ends every day, so how do we build a new one? And that, that tends to be what my books are about when I look back on it, probably because of my upbringing. And, um, which I, as many of you will know, uh, is, you know, is a very strict and religious and uh, very apocalyptic about the end of the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's kind of, um, th that's the feeling. It's not that I love writing about dystopias. It's just like, it's just how I feel. It's, it's sort of an emotional representation of what the world's not. I said that forever about um, stuff, things like Hunger Games, um, which is another question, by the way, is this a standalone novel? It is. It's not a prequel to a bunch of material that I've, written before, I'm not trying to get your money by recycling the same old stuff. Um, you know, hey, other people are allowed to do that. And if you want to buy it, good for you. Uh, you can't. No, I'm totally teasing. If you love that stuff, then great. But I don't know why anybody would want to vote from the point of view of Edward. Um, it's a standalone book. Uh, and what was I talking about? I don't even remember. Um, I don't even remember, actually, I talked myself out of it. I got so hung up on that joke that I don't even remember. But that's okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, if I remember it, I'll come back to it. Um, so, yeah, boy, lots of things coming in, lots of people. Hello again, I'm going to go to another question. And the question is, what is your writing process? Are you a planner or a pantser? A... <laughs> I've not heard the term pantser in relation to writing, but uh, uh, I'm not particularly a planner. I plan a, I plan enough so that I don't get lost, but uh, not so much that I don't feel like I can create on the page. Because the example I always use is um, for Knife of Never Letting Go, I had a few images. I knew how it began and ended. I had a few images. I kind of knew their rough journey, um, but I was writing towards those images. And, uh, and they can be big images or small images, for me anyway. Uh, as, as long as they kind of resonate, and as long as they kind of echo something compelling to me that I am looking forward to writing. And, uh, ah, fly by the seat of your pants. That's what they mean by pants, sir. They don't mean pulling someone's pants down, which is the generally agreed um, definition of pantsing, but okay. Um, so I do a combination of both, I guess. And uh, so I'm trying to write towards this image, something that feels like I'm excited to get to. Um, like the death of a certain character in Knife of Never Letting Go, or something small, like there's a um, scene in Knife of Never Letting Go where they get into that herd of creatures that just call here to one another. So it can be big or small. And I write towards those things because I know I'm excited to write them. And um, But while leaving enough space in between to create, like Wilf, who is one of my very favorite characters that I've ever written, showed up on the day I needed him. I didn't plan him before. He just was there on the day. And so I need enough planning so I don't feel lost, but not not so much that I don't feel trapped and can't create when it comes. So I think that's a pretty good pretty good question. Um, let's see what else there are people saying over there. And another question is, oh, this, they sent me so many questions. I'm sorry if I don't get to them booksellers. I love booksellers. I would try to answer all your questions um, if you... If I could. Um, let's see. There are multiple points of view in Burn. Do you have a technique when you're writing to keep storylines of each of the characters clear in your mind? Some others like some authors like to storyboard or map a character's journey. Um, I don't. I tend not to do that. From I remember from my very first book, which is a gigantic and obscure novel called The Crash of Hennington. There are 14 major characters, and so I did have a bit of a spreadsheet um, to let me keep track of who had gotten sort of screen time, if you know what I mean. But since then, I haven't. Um, I tend to just keep track of word count because I like the word count for each chapter because there's a kind of rhythm that goes into chapter writing and it's it's different for each book, but each book does have a rhythm. Um, so no, no, I, um, I tend not to, but I know people do. And if you do that and you finish with the book, you, you've done it right. So there's no right way. There's many, 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 many ways up the novel writing mountain. If you get to the peak, you did it right. Here we go. Um, some class questions. Am I particularly drawn to questions about faith and people's belief? Sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes because I mean, I was raised with, I was raised in a very particular faith. And I think that there is, and particularly there's a very, very key moment in Burn and a very, very important one um, 
where that moment, which we all have, um, big and small as teenagers, we all have it where we step away from everything we've been taught and see the world anew. You know, we step away from this point of view that we've had at home, whatever it is, good or bad, you know, not, there's no judgment here, but we step away from it and say, oh, there is something different that I believe. What I have previously believed, I'm going to question. And that can be big, you know, that can be a violent and life-changing moment. It can be small. You can go, oh, actually, no, I do agree with what I, what I was raised to believe, you know, but I think we all do it in ways big and small, especially as a teenager. And there's a line in Burn where a um, character who's raised in, again, a strict cult, essentially, says he steps into the campfire and to meet another character, and thus the fate of billions was changed. And that, to me, is the interesting question about faith and belief. Um, you know, faith is such a powerful thing. Um, it's so powerful almost on its own that, in a way, it's a separate from the thing that you might be believing in. It's the belief that gives you the power. And that kind of power is... Um, human and interesting and it really is a proper power you know because people with faith do a lot of stuff good and bad you know just like people without faith you know but but it's, it's interesting the question of what we believe is always interesting to me i really try not to judge because there are very very good good people and people like to people like to hit on religion with a blunt hammer if there's such a thing um and uh i just think that it's more complicated than that, and people are more complicated than that, and there are very good people and very bad people in all walks of life and all degrees of belief and non-belief. So, um, yeah, so I try not to be judgmental. I just like to explore the question of it. Um, let's see what else. What are you? What are you people asking? Uh, Wilf is awesome. He is awesome. I love Wilf. Hi from New Jersey. Hi Malcolm, McMaster. Um, hi Christina. What's my favorite book that I wrote? Well, see, I get this question a lot, and uh, so I always ask whoever asks me that question. I always ask back. Uh, if you have brothers and sisters, and if so, are you your parents' favorite child? Because <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> they, I, was, I was an afterthought. I was years after the others, and uh, I'm kind of like, whoops, here he is. But um, so I would say the, um, the, your parents do have a favorite child, but they should never tell you, and that's only appropriate. So that's the same I feel about my books. You know, yeah, I've got ones I've, I've loved them all. I feel like I've raised them all, I've sent them off into the world, and I love them for all of their good parts and their bad parts and their stinkiness and their quirks and things they do well and the things they do badly and their flaws. I just love them. So it's 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 not that it's not quite the same. I don't really have a favorite of the books that I wrote. So there you go. Another question. Um, whose writing do you most admire and what are your favorite books of recent years? Uh, I I'm a huge fan of many, many, many decades now of the Australian writer Peter Carey, who won the Booker Prize twice. Um, I love his work. I, there is a kind of, it's again about this question of whether this is a standalone or not. And that question is, um, it is a standalone book. Uh, there is, however, more to the story if it needs to be told. I don't know that I'll write it, um, but... Peter Carey does this thing that I love, which is that each book feels like it is a smaller slice of a larger imagined world. Like in Oscar and Lucinda, which is a great, great novel, um, he constantly refers to, not constantly, but refers to the life of Lucinda after the book. And we never see that life. We never see how she gets to the life. She becomes a labor leader. And he refers to this, but we never see it. We just know that it's in her future. And I love that. I love the idea that they're are gestures towards a much larger world out there and that um, it's not just this story that's going on. So I suppose that's 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 why I love Peter Carey and that's what I try to do in my books. And I also love, I love Ali Smith, the brilliant Scottish writer, Ali Smith. I think she is just an absolute gem. Um, really, the clarity mixed with the experimentation is so hard to do. And I think she's amazing. And I truly think she's the next... UK Nobel Laureate. Um, I think she's incredible. And I love, there's an English writer called Nicola Barker, um, who I also love very much. And I just, I just try not to be a snob. That's what I tell people. Um, be open-minded. You know, you might find things that you are surprised by, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, the great film critic, uh, Pauline Kael, 
said uh, about the movies. She said, the movies are so rarely great art that if you can't appreciate great trash, why go? And it's kind of the same for books, you know. Um, there's great stuff, and great has a flexible definition of great, you know. There's different kinds of great. So uh, you can, something can be really trashy and really great. <laughs> so I really believe that. So just try not to be a snob. Okay, that was my first list of questions. They sent me a second list. So I'm going to find that second list. And that second list says, um, here we go. Here it is. Um, how difficult was it writing a screenplay as a, opposed to writing the book The Monster Calls? I did never written a book called The Monster Calls. No, it's, uh, it's A Monster Calls. But I have uh, Burn, again, uh, one of the, my rare books that the title doesn't get um, altered frequently. Um, uh, Life of Never Letting Go is often called The Night of Letting Go. Um, um, uh, Ask and the Answer gets changed. Um, the Rest of Us Just Live Here gets changed to like the rest of us don't, you know, they all change. People call monster calls when a monster calls or the monster calls. So anyway, that's okay. It's perfectly fine. It's absolutely fine. What a ridiculous problem to have. Uh, yeah, I, screenplays are just um, different kinds of storytelling. And I really want to keep growing. I never want to be complacent as a writer. I've said this a lot. I think complacency is creative death. And so I want to keep stretching and learning and pushing and trying new things. And when I got approached I was very lucky enough to get approached a lot uh, for Monster Calls as a possible movie. And, uh, and they're really good people sometimes and really, you know, but sometimes there were thoughts about the movie that I didn't agree with. And I thought, well, I, you know, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm certainly not going to fund the film. <laughs> so, um, but maybe I can start the argument and say, this is how I see it. And maybe somebody will respond to that. Um, and so uh, I kind of just, plunged in and just thought, well, I'm going to write the screenplay. I'm going to lay out what I believe. And if somebody responds to that, then fantastic, you know, and, uh, but at least I've started the conversation. So that's kind of how it feels. I mean, it's, it's much more collaborative. You're really in charge of everything when you're a novelist. And so it's a different kind of challenge, but it is all essentially storytelling. So if you write books and you want to try other kinds of writing, really do it. I mean, you know, there are things that I'm not very good at. I'm really not at all good at poetry, excuse me, or verse. Really not. Um, no, that's okay. You know, I've got other stuff that I feel I can do. So yeah, keep trying stuff. So let's see, what are people saying? Um, da, 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 da. Lots of questions about class, um, which is cool. Um, except I'm not talking about class today. I'm talking about burn today. So okay, then no problem. Uh, but I love class. I miss class. Wish we had more of class. I have lots of uh, lots of things to say about class that, like I said, maybe one day I'll say in that memoir. <laughs> Any advice to new writers on improving their writing skills, asks Stephanie. Now this, uh, I, a long time, not a long time ago, but I should say many years ago, it's not even that, but I was writer in residence for Book Trust, the charity Book Trust. And so if you search Book Trust, all one word, my name and writing tips, then I wrote a bunch. I mean, I wrote a bunch, just sort of how my process works for me. Again, nobody can tell you how to write. They can only tell you how they write. Um, and so, if you're interested, search my name, book trust, and writing tips. And I talk about voice. I talk about pacing. Um, just, you know, things that, potential stumbling blocks, you know, that I saw myself. And the last three are how I got published. Again, this may not be how you get published, but this is just how I got published. So um, so have a look. Have a look um, uh, at that if you're interested in, in writing about that. Um, but, yeah, but thanks for the class love. I really do appreciate the class love. And, um, yeah, I wish there was more of it. Should be in season three by now, at least. Alas, uh, but hey, how lucky you might have gotten to write a TV show for the BBC. You know, I wrote all eight episodes. All oh, every word of that is mine. Which is, you know, how often does that happen? Almost never. So I, I will take, I will take, the, I take that as a blessing and a great experience. So let's see. Um, la 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 la. Uh, do I prefer writing for YR or adults? I don't really prefer either. I mean, there's a kind of, oh, Rosie just put my writing tips, my publicist just put my writing tips in the comments. So, um, yeah, so uh, have a look. Um, I neither, I mean, I, I, again, it's I, genre and audience are, are slippery things. You know, you can slide between them and you can slide, um, you can, you know, 
erase the boundaries a little. And I kind of like that. I mean, I think all the best fiction takes place on the boundaries. I think that's why YA is so exciting because it takes place on the boundaries of becoming an adult and finding out who you are and pushing at your boundaries. So I don't know, it's more what the story needs. I think it's a little disingenuous to say, which I've said in the past, but, but I think I'm wrong to say, um, oh, I just take what the story needs me, you know, ahead of time, you know, and also, um, I'm contracted to a YA publisher, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna turn in some, you know, the erotic adventures of Hercules. Um, uh, but uh, although, you know, that could be fun, but it's not probably not YA, but so, so you know, ahead of time, but um, mainly, again, it's, it's the question about just not being a snob about either. This is important. Because often when I'm on YA panels, the chair will often say, well, I think YA, um, I think YA is just better than literary fiction. Well, no, but literary fiction also isn't better than YA. They're, they're both vast fields where a few books are absolutely brilliant, many are pretty good, and then there's a lot that are just okay. And that just happens in any art form. So again, don't be a snob about it. Choose both. Um, right. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Who's asking stuff? Um, uh, I was a little bit involved in the Chaos Walking movie script, um, so were other writers, as you may have read, but uh, that's coming out in January. Again, I've seen, you know what? Every time I talk about Chaos Walking, uh, somebody puts up something that I didn't say um, So uh, online, so I'm not actually going to talk about it, but um, it's coming in January. I think you're going to like it. That's what I'll say. Um, what else is here we go? What are you reading during lockdown? I, as I said, I've been, and other things, I've been reading the Wolf Hall trilogy because I think Hilary Mantel is an incredible writer. Um, and I am nearly done with the third book. I'm kind of dreading the end because it has one inevitable ending, um, but I'm nearly there. Um, I have, for the past many, several years, I've just been on a slow, long reread of Stephen King and I'm up to Gerald's game. which may not be in the top echelon of, of Stephen King, but it's interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, so yeah, and I've been buying a lot of books, uh, you know, which I tend to put on my Instagram just to say, say this is what I bought, you know, who knows if I like all of it, but uh, yeah. Um, what am I most looking forward to out of lockdown? A haircut. Um, let's see here, what else? What are people asking? Um, how do I approach emphasizing actions and dialogue of great significance and prose? I either end up emphasizing every single action or just nothing at all. Um, well, I mean, I always think, trust your reader, for one thing, definitely trust your reader, they're so smart, and they will pick up so many things just by emphasis, uh, and um, you know, the, the less you provide, they will fill in the blanks, and that's just an act of faith on your part. And um, no Wolf Hall spoilers, please. It's history. Anyway, um, so, uh, maybe paring back, but what I just do is I think if I'm, um, uh, if it's a sad sequence, I need to, I need to feel sad or the reader's not going to feel sad. If it's an exciting sequence, I need to feel excited about writing it or a reader will never feel that thrill. You know, um, if it's funny, I better be laughing because it is such arrogance to ask your reader to feel something that you don't. And so that's how I tend to do it. And then editing and you know, and uh, second drafts and third drafts and fourth drafts, that's where you can pull it back. So just get it all down, get all of it down in the first draft and don't worry so much about how perfect it is then because it's not perfect then. You know, I've always said over and over again, and this is really, this is true, nobody reads my first drafts, absolutely nobody. And I know that going in, I know before I start, um, so then I can make mistakes and I can change my mind and I can realize, um, uh, you know, 5% before the end that, oh, the book is about this. So I have to go back and make sure that the book looks like that all the way to the end. Um, so, um, yeah, so maybe that. Don't worry about your first draft so much. Just get it all down and then you can massage it into a book. You know, my second drafts tend to be drastically shorter than my first drafts because I cut out a lot. The first draft of Monsters of Men was 180,000 words and the final published version I think is 120 which is, you know, I cut out a whole book, more or less. Um, but I was finding my way. I was figuring it out. So, um, yeah. So in the right way. Uh, and Sue is saying, don't forget to order your books from Lingen's Bookshop, Book of Books, Bookish or Forum Books, um, which I said at the top, but thank you for the reminder. <laughs> it's very good. Support your independent bookstores. Um, I'll do a couple more questions, and then I'll go. 
Uh, oh, someone's saying now that she was joking about the spoiler wolf hall spoilers. No, I was teasing. I was teasing. Um, let's see, if you could go into the world of one of your books, which one would it be? Oh my God, none of them. Have you read them? Eee, none of them. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, do, do, no, that's, I already answered that question. Um, when you began writing Life from Never Letting Go, did you always intend it being the start of a series or did the storyline evolve into a trilogy? No, I always meant it to be a trilogy. I knew how each book began and ended. And when I talked to my publishers, um, I told them it was a trilogy and I said, this is how books two and three <laughs> begin and end. Um, yeah, I mean, other people don't and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but mostly it was that I like stories that end, you know, I mean, I don't like them to sort of go on artificially and um you know i like a story that comes to a completion and then suggests that there's more but you know stops there again i really it's why I, again it's why i know as a fan a fan i really i really get like the new hunger games book i really understand that and as if you know and if if i was a huge 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 hunger games fan of, and I, i've done this with other things that i'm a huge fan of i would just i would take everything that was written in that world um, you know, and I hope it's great. I hope people love it. Um, but I kind of, part of me also wants for, well, if this imagination came up with this great world, I'd love to see a new one. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, I like a trilogy that finishes, um, because then I want to tell other stories. Um, you know, I, I always leave your audience wanting more. If you give them absolutely everything, then the thing that you give them turns out to be something less, I think. So I did plan it as a trilogy, and I don't plan any more books. Um, never say never. I never say never, but I don't certainly don't plan anymore. So um, let's see here. Uh, la, 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 la. Are you working on anything at the moment? I am. I am working on a uh, film adaptation of Lord of the Flies here in the beautiful Penguin Classics Deluxe Edition with uh, deckled edges. Not deckled edges. Um, what do you call those? Um, which uh, will be directed by Luke Guadagnino, who directed Call Me By Your Name. I am uh, working on uh, a horror film that I uh, sold to Lionsgate, and I'm, um, yeah, thinking about what the next book might be. Don't know yet. Don't know yet. Mostly, though, I'm spending my time online talking about Burn, <laughs> which has dragons. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so, okay. So I do a couple more questions, and then I'm going to, head off. I've been, uh, um, I've been here for about a half an hour. So, um, and I know Marion Keyes did uh, an hour, but Marion Keyes is marvelous and absolutely wonderful and just the most genuinely lovely human being you'd ever want to meet. She's an absolute joy, by the way. So this is what I mean about um, not, not, you know, not being an ostensible snob about uh, if you work, work on YA, well, then I'm not going to know anything about any other kinds of fiction. That's just not true. Uh, Mary Keyes is lovely. She's hilarious. Um, way funnier than me. And so therefore, more likely you'd want to watch an hour <laughs> with her. So, um, yeah. How do you pronounce Viola's name? I pronounce it Viola. Um, I think the movie, the movie is a little bit different, but I pronounce it Viola, which is, uh, I believe, the correct pronunciation from Twelfth Night, which is where I got the name. It's uh, Viola's from Twelfth Night. That's sort of the shifting identity of Viola. Twelfth night is a big thing, and uh, um, let's see, let's see what else. What else are people asking? I'll do a couple more. What were the positive aspects of having a monster calls made into a film? Um, well, I got to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. That's what films do, <laughs> even when they don't, even when they're in hits. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, I just I'm so proud of that movie. I'm so proud of it. I mean, what what a privilege to have a movie come out. A, a way in the way that I so much envisioned it, and then so much more um, that a director brought J. A. Viona, um, which I could never do because I'm not a director, and that's uh, that to me that's the crazy, that's the amazing thing about um, collaboration. And uh, so yeah, I'm really really happy with that. I'm so lucky. Um, and uh, oh, Rebecca says her son love watching. Well, thank you, thank you, to Evan uh, out there. Uh, you can call this you can call this uh, sort of thirty five minutes of homeschooling. Let's call it that. And so, um, uh, when writing Burn, being an amalgamation of so many things, what tropes do you like that you wanted to put in your own style for Burn? Okay, 
to me, I think trope is the word where joy dies. Uh, I, there are, of course, cliches in YA, and there are, of course, tropes. Of course there are. But I never think about them unless I'm consciously having some fun with them, like in the rest of us just live here. So it's not... I preferred um, China Mieville. I don't know why I said a name like that. China Mieville talks about um, engaging with the protocols, and that's how I like to think about it. It's not so much the tropes, what I'm going to do with the tropes, and uh, it's engaging with the protocols of YA that are there. And it's how you engage that makes the book interesting, I think. So, of course, there are things that often get done. And so, but how do you engage with that? There's nothing wrong with that. There are things that often get done in most romances, and there are things that um, often get done in most thrillers. And there's, you know, so it's how you engage with those protocols uh, is what's going to make people read. And so for Burn, it was really just, uh, I'd never done anything even slightly historical of the novel. It was, um, uh, yeah, it was how do you deal, how could I upset the, well, actually a good example, prophecy is a trope. I kind of hate the word trope, but I know what you mean. Um, prophecy is a trope. So how can you play with that? How could I play with that? How could the story of that be upended? And, um, you know, because the ongoing joke becomes that Casimir the dragon is here because of prophecy, but he doesn't quite know what it means. And that's that to me is really funny, and that to me is really what prophecy is kind of about, that prophecies only make sense in retrospect. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, that's I suppose that. I suppose that. That's really good. Um, uh, thank you. I'm getting lots of nice comments here, and I would actually, um, my publicist gently reminds me that um, uh, we've talked a bit about, I've talked a bit about the play, uh, the movie of a monster, calls um but the play of monster calls of which i'm also super super proud of even though my participation was a wildly different kind of thing there because th those were people who really knew what they were doing i basically just said don't fuck it up that's pretty much literally what i said at the end of every rehearsal <laughs> and i that's okay i'm gonna swear i don't care um but if you there was a touring production in the uk that was going to go to washington dc um it's been canceled because of the pandemic but among, uh, the Old Vic Theatre is going to show for a week, just a week, uh, on its YouTube channel, um, several of their productions, and the first one they're going to show is A Monster Calls, and that's going to start June 5th for one week, um, so please tune in, it's free, it's totally free and available, so it's a, Old Vic is a entirely charitable, uh, user-supported um, theatre, so, uh, uh, you know, so support them if you can, because they're a great theatre that, you know, is really suffering in this time of, of no tickets. But from June 5th, look, look up the Old Vic and look up their YouTube channel and have a look at the Monster Calls play. So, um, someone said, could I read a little bit before um, I go? And, uh, yeah, I haven't got any of this. It's so early in publication that I haven't got a, a reading that I like just yet, one that's sort of one that's sort of perfect. Um, maybe, maybe, um, oh, maybe by just the very end of chapter one, where Sarah and her father have made their arrangement with the dragon. They have agreed that the dragon will work on their farm and they are driving back to the farm at midnight after they've met him at a gas station. So Sarah has been allowed to drive home by her father to practice for the driver's test. And they're talking about something the dragon asked about needing a witness. And so uh, this is the very end of chapter one. And I'll read that and then I will um, then I will uh, say my farewells to this quite fun trip. Thank you all you lovely people. This will be up on At Home For Indies page, At Home With For Indies page, um, for eternity, in perpetuity. So uh, watch at your leisure. Um, and so thank you again to Book of Books, Bookish Books, Lingham's Booksellers, and for Forum, Forum Books. I'm so sorry. So I've had to juggle a lot in my head. Um, la, 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 la. Foreign books, I got it right. Very good. Book of books, bookish books, foreign books, link and lingus books. So um, just a little, very, very little bit from the end of chapter one of Burn, and then I'll head out. So thank you all for coming. So here we go. What was that about a witness? Sarah asked. What was I a witness to? Dragons think men lie, her father said, offering an explanation but no apology, and require at least one other witness to every legal agreement. Well, couldn't the witness just lie too? Um, Sarah asked. Well, of course, said her dad, and of course it happens, but at the very least the guilt spreads. Two men are compromised, not just one. He shrugged. 
dragon philosophy, I guess. Well, we lied, Sarah said. He glanced over at her. Well, we did. We don't have any gold to pay it with at the end. I told you not to worry about that, her father said. Well, how can I not, she asked. Dragons are dangerous. We lied to it. That guilt has spread between both of us. There's no guilt on you, Sarah. And his tone was such that no further questions were allowed, not least how much guilt he was carrying. Besides, he said, it's more about compromising them, their sense of what a word means, their adherence to whatever they regard as principles. Sarah couldn't help herself. That sounds a lot like what creatures with souls do. Sarah, her father warned. The truck flew off the road. At first, Sarah thought she'd somehow swerved into a ditch as the front of the truck dropped, slamming her into the steering wheel and sliding her father all the way off his seat into the dashboard. He called out, but more in surprise than pain, catching himself with his hand. Sarah slammed on the brakes, but nothing happened. They kept rocking forward as if they would turn a complete somersault until they were rocked back, both of them helplessly thrown into their seats as the rear of the truck now dipped. What the hell, her father said, alarmed. The truck rocked forward again, and Sarah looked out at the road, pulling away beneath them. He picked us up, her father said, stretching around to look out the back window. Sarah glanced, too, though she was too afraid to let go of the steering wheel to glance for long. The rear claws of the dragon had grabbed the truck on either side, like an eagle that had just caught a salmon. Sarah looked forward again at the road and trees that were now rushing, rushing past beneath them as the dragon's great wings beat, carrying them, she hoped, to their farm. He picked us up, her father said again, barely controlling his anger. Is he going to drop us? Sarah asked. She could see that her father didn't know the answer. They were in the dragon's claws. They had absolutely no say in what would happen next. Thanks very much. That's Burn. It's out now. Order from a nice, good, proper, independent bookseller. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for all the lovely comments. I uh, hope to talk to you again soon.